I will start from uh, basic and I will go through uh, some very preliminary thing regarding uh, blended learning. And then later we will move on to uh, online teaching. Um, uh, in the feedback form also, somebody suggested uh, best practices. Sir. So therefore we will also uh, highlight and uh, uh, some best practices uh, when it comes to online teaching and learning. Now, um, over the next few slides, I will uh, give a, a short question and then we will ponder about it and then uh, think about how we are actually going to uh, address that question. So number one is, are we going to continue teaching? Uh, it's a resounding, it's a resounding yes. Uh, there's no, uh, I don't need to get any feedback from y'all uh, before y'all can actually say no, but I, I better say yes. Sir. So we are definitely teaching. The next question is, are we ready to offer online learning? We are ready to continue teaching, but we definitely So therefore, alternative is to do online uh, teaching. Eh? So therefore, online learning has become a norm. So we are going to address the question, are we ready to offer online? So this one, I need your feedback. Uh, I hope you all have uh, logged in to Mentimeter. Uh, if you can go to the Mentimeter now and uh, <clears throat> Okay, if you can <clears throat> start uh, polling, uh, I am ready to offer online learning. Whether you agree or not, uh, please uh, give me your feedback. Uh, the, and the response is coming in now. So I'm going to teach you a trick now. Um, since we are doing this Mentimeter, uh, I am actually online now uh, on my another terminal and I'm looking at uh, how many people have actually registered on the uh, so down uh, the response from my Mentimeter and I have approximately uh, only 12 have actually uh, uh, given their feedback actually so um, there are some of us who are, who are not uh, uh, currently uh, engaged. So Mentimeter is one of the thing about uh, Mentimeter is that it's a very quick uh, way of finding out whether the, the participants on the other end, are they in tune with what you are actually um, talking about now, or, uh, whatever that sessions that you're actually uh, providing whether they are uh, in tune with it. Huh? So um, you could easily use this Mentimeter. So it's a very uh, simple tool to use. Um, so I will not be covering that, but if you want to know, uh, if you find it difficult, you can always uh, ask me about that. Now, um, like I said, this cover some basic things. Huh? This is the, the online page. Huh? I can hear some background noise. Uh, never mind. My Ely page. Eh? This is my Ely page. Uh, this is exactly my Ashley Edward Roy Suse's uh, Ely page. Eh? So some basic things. Uh, this is the navigational panel. Now um, in here, my courses. If you have already registered on your Ely uh, as a, whether a coordinator or a teacher, so you will your courses will appear under this particular. Uh, place. Uh. So you will come. These are the courses that currently that I'm engaged in. So those are the courses that you will actually see um, if you are uh, part of that course. So then you will actually see that courses. Uh. Now, what, what happens is that there are also some resources and that I would like to highlight uh. when you have the free time. Please go and look at it. Use one of it is COVID-19 response for lecturers, uh, particularly for lecturers. Uh, it'll be a good thing for you to actually go and browse through. At least you know where the resources are and then you can actually uh, um, utilize the resources uh, when it is needed. Now the one way which, which you can't actually see very clearly, but uh, this one, what it basically tells you is that or it 
cautions everyone who uses my elite page is that um, you cannot upload any file that is bigger than 10 uh, megabytes. Uh, previously, we can do 100. Now uh, we have limited it to uh, only 10. So, though for, uh, so far, what you can actually do, uh, if you scroll down this page, it will actually give you what are the alternative things that you can actually do to overcome the problem. So this is just to highlight to you about the basic things about uh, eLibma. Um, told you that. Now, if you scroll down further uh, on the same page, you'll find that this hot spots, hot feeling loss, looking for ID uh, from Lajaran, um, basically e-learning uh, and bridging guidelines, and then ICT competency. Yeah? Now, all these are very useful, but particular for this is very useful. I would uh, advise you to have a look at this. There's a lot of resources uh, behind this hotspot. Uh, and uh, click on that um, particular hotspot. Huh? When you click on this particular hotspot, you will be actually web, uh, simple like a cost, your own cost. So they have a created course uh, page for uh, under title called uh, guidelines uh, for academics, uh, guides for academics for e-learning. Now in that page, if you scroll, you will find the online step-by-step -step guide using infographic. And here you will have a PDF file which all uh, tells you what the things said uh, with regards to the infographic. And especially this one, I would like to highlight this one. This is the this is the gold mine of uh, uh, that particular web page, uh, compendium of online teaching resources. Now, in this compendium, you'll find a lot of ideas and a lot of things that have been done over the uh, MCO period. When the MCO was uh, initiated, people have actually done a lot of uh, um, different different ways of how to cope with online teaching and so on. All those videos and PDF files and everything has been compiled together and created into one particular place. This is how it will look like. And the best part of this uh, PDF file is, is an active PDF file. So therefore, when you scroll down and you, li you like a particular um, a top, what you can actually do is you can click on the uh, right hand uh, column where there's, there's a view the video or view PDF and so on. If you can click on that, it will take you to a, uh, a YouTube channel. I think Come has got, I'm not sure about this, but Come has got a, a YouTube channel where all these uh, two, uh, videos have been together in that particular channel and you can uh, the the entire uh, video. So for example, here um, I can highlight to you later uh, some of the interesting things about uh, this kind of videos that there are. So meanwhile, you can actually go into this page. Uh, even now, you can actually do it in your in your free time, and you can go and look through it, and then you can ask. If you have any query regarding that, then you can come back to me, and I can actually, if I cannot solve it, I can address it to a person who can actually do it. Huh? So you can actually download this active uh, PDF file. Huh? And then keep it on your desktop, and you can actually uh, do it uh, whenever you want to. Uh, when you have an idea and you want to do it, you can actually go and look through this uh, PDF. Uh, this is very important. This is what uh, the whole thing about blended learning is. Uh, this is what we call uh, elite blended learning practitioners checklist, huh? checklist or a guide for you to actually, when you construct your uh, course, uh, your posting, uh, even your blog, um, these are, uh, there are four parts in this check. One, the pinkish color, green, uh, blue, blue or turquoise, I'm not sure. And then some uh, light yellow. Now, these four different uh, parts have got criterias. 
all you need to do is fulfill the criteria and you will be given the blended learning status. So, OK, um, here is a page uh, which is uh, which is made for this coming session. Um, this is a page uh, for the first block. Now you can see that uh, this is the thing that I told you about the magic number in three, two, one. Uh, at the moment, uh, you can see here, uh, uh, it's only uh, two of the resources are given. Three activities is there, uh, are there, and then assessment. I don't have anything at the moment. Now they are lighted up in this way. Eh? Once it turns green, that means you fulfill the uh, the offering status only. Eh? Offering status uh, of the activities in in this case. Now it will turn green once you've satisfied the number of minimum uh, minimum uh, uh, offering of resources, activities and assessment. That doesn't mean that you have reached uh, um, blended learning status. Huh? The blended learning status is achieved only when your stars are lighting up. Okay, The first one star might light up, then two or then three. The three is the best. Okay, But I hope uh, if you can't achieve three or so, at least one will do. The reason why is that uh, the, the faculty needs to also have a KPI to uh, to achieve, which all ideally we want to get uh, all the courses uh, uh, with a blended learning status. But if at all, no, but we want to get everyone to uh, achieve that status. Now, so this is what um, what it will look like in the beginning of the semester. Now, here I'm showing you what last year's uh, um, the same course, uh, last year's achievement, uh, 732, but I've actually offered about 107 resources, uh, activities, about 12 activities, and then assessment 14. And we managed to achieve uh, three star. Now, the, what does the star mean? Uh, here's an explanation of what the star means and how do you actually get the, the stars? Uh? It actually measures the quality of your blended learning practices by gauging at the active participation of your students in the activities that you have created. Now, number one, if you get one uh, particular star, what it means is that basically one participation for each activity and three submissions for each assessment. Your resources you have fulfilled. You've got about seven resources. Therefore, you have minimum one of your students have actually participated in the activity and three submissions for each assessments have been made. So then you will automatically get a one star. It is very easy to achieve. Okay, two stars, 30% of a total enrolled students participated. Okay, 30%. We have 100 students. You've got about 30 students doing this minimum things. So if they do that, then you will have um, two stars. How do you get three stars? A minimum of 50% of the total enrolled students. If you have 100 students, 51 students have actually achieved whatever this uh, offering that you have given and they have participated. Therefore, you will get three stars. So I hope uh, this explains uh, what it means by the one star, two star and three star. <clears throat> OK, next question. Are you ready to offer online learning? Um, well, we have already tabulated the, the results earlier uh, and people have uh, said that uh, most of you all have agreed uh, that you are ready. Uh, one said maybe. So the rest uh, out of the 12 uh, people who participated in that interaction uh, said 11 said uh, yes and one said maybe. Yeah? Now, um, teaching is like breathing for academics. I would I would really like to ask every one of you all. Do you know who said this? But I'm sure I can't get the feedback. Um, if somebody can actually uh, write to me on the on the chat group, uh, that'll be great. Uh, I will tell you who actually told this huh, later. Teaching is like breathing for academics. Huh? Somebody that you know, all of you all know. Huh? Unimas basically provides the hardware and software. But what? we have to do is just basically uh, provide our ability to utilize the software to create an engagement, uh, engage our students in a uh, fruitful environment uh, for learning, teaching and learning to take place. Huh? Thanks, Unika. Uh, you got it spot on. Huh? 
uh, our DVC for academic, uh, he was the one who said that uh, teaching is like breathing for academics. Uh, um, quote unquote, Ahmad Atta Rasid. Uh. Now, uh, a bit about uh, this so-called online communication platform that we are using at the moment. Uh, uh, I'm trying to engage with you guys using uh, OCP. Uh. This is what is called an uh, on online uh, communication platform, uh, or sometimes it's referred to as e-learning. Uh. Now, it is also known as web conferencing uh, platforms, also known as webinar platforms. Now, uh, it is classified under non-physical face-to-face communication. Now, Unimas clearly uh, have um, engaged two uh, different companies. Uh, one is Cisco WebEx team, and the other one is Microsoft uh, Teams. Uh. Now, both these platforms are, are available for all of us to utilize. Um, today, I'm using Microsoft Teams. Uh. Now, some of us do prefer to use Zoom, uh, but the the I wouldn't say the problem. Zoom is very nice to use. Uh, I, I do like to use them, but uh, the only shortcoming using Zoom is it is restricted to 40 minutes. Okay. If you have a license, then uh, then you can use it for unlimited time. Huh? Uh, I use it for other other things uh, outside, but not uh, for uh, academic purposes. Huh? Now, what happened is that Zoom uh, during the MCO. They, they actually gave us an unlimited uh, um, usage time, huh? but uh, now they have reverted uh, to that 40 minutes uh, time limit. There's a, there's a way how you can overcome that 40 minutes, but it's very tedious. So I didn't want to take the risk of doing it here. Uh, you can do a subsequent uh, uh, a tandem uh, meeting schedule in order for you to just go through uh, the, the Zoom uh, platform. Now, these are all called uh, OCPs, uh, basically online communication platform. Now, all OCPs are good. They can, we can able to uh, communicate with our participants. Uh. They have similar attributes, but they are not the same. Okay? Some of them have got some uh, shortcomings. Some of them, basically their attributes are different. The way how they place the, the graphic user interface is slightly different. So you need to just go and venture and look for the particular uh, place where you want to um, go to. I've got a second interaction with you now. Um, please go back to Mentimeter and uh, the same code and you can actually have access to it. I'd like to, uh, if somebody who has not heard uh, me saying this earlier, Mentimeter again, uh, it's good to uh, find whether your, your participants are still engaged in whatever sessions that you're conducting. So I've got about, uh, again, uh, now I have 11. <laughs> Previously I had 12, now I have 11. So uh, you can't conclude much, but at least you can tell uh, out of the, the entire class, how many have actually uh, are actively engaging with you. So um, Mentimeter is one way of uh, you can show. Earlier on, uh, when we logged, when all of us logged in at 1.30, uh, after logging in, I, I just went out. I, I went to to the, the bathroom and then I walked around. And then I saw one of the participants and then said, oh, this is the beauty of online learning. Huh? You logged in, but then you're not actually uh, there present. Huh? So that's uh, one way. Yeah? So you can actually try to tell your students that uh, there will be some kind of interaction uh, sporadically in your session, so they will be more uh, aware that they need to follow you uh, through the entire session. So this is how I use my uh, Mentimeter to engage the students. Huh? It's very simple, but uh, it's uh, kind of effective. Oh, now I've got 12 back. <clears throat> Thank you. OK, um, let's move on. Now, uh, we are ready to offer online learning. Now, the next question, uh, the next question, the burning question is that, are our students ready? We can be ready. Uh, we can be ready to continue teaching. We can be ready to offer online learning. We have no everything. You create a fantastic page uh, offering all your resources and your whatever course designs and so on. But what 
we sometimes fail to understand is that are our students ready? Okay, uh, thanks Greta for the very good question. Huh? They are all anonymous. Uh, the the poll uh, on uh, Mentimeter, they are all anonymous. anonymous huh? I'm not sure if I can actually see who actually. Uh, no, I don't think so. We can never do that. Mentimeter is uh, anonymous. Hope answered the question. Now, uh, this question, uh, whether uh, our students are ready. Uh, can you please? Uh, can you please participate in this? What do you think? Uh? You can actually see the 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 result on real time. Huh? I I can switch to another uh, web page and show you all, but I don't want to do that because then it will take some time for me to uh, re-engage. But maybe what I can do is I can try to show you all huh, what I'm seeing on my another terminal. Huh? Everybody can actually see huh, that uh, you, you can actually see it in uh, live uh, what it's showing. Huh? So I hope you all have seen that. So you can actually. Uh, view real time what is the result of your poll um, and at the moment uh, there are 10 people who participated uh, so I can roughly guess uh, there was about 17 people registered uh, in the beginning uh, I know a couple of them told me that they are unable to uh, continue uh, so I know that um, should be about 14 to 15 uh, actively but I only get about 10 to 12 so that's the that's the reality. Yeah? So um, are our students ready? So nobody said no. Huh? So everybody, uh, half of you said yes, and the other half said maybe. Yeah? The maybe is a gray area, which is very good, yeah, which is very good because we are questioning ourselves on whether our students are actually ready or not. Huh? Now, these are the, the, the worked out or research has actually shown huh, the eight dimensions of readiness for online learning among participants. Uh, let it be students, let it be adult learners. What? These are the eight uh, dimensions. Uh. Now, of all of these eight dimensions, uh, which one do you think it's uh, very relevant or very important, extremely crucial? When it comes to Malaysia, Malaysia setting, uh, you can you can chat with me. You can just uh, write uh, what, what's what do you uh, what do you think? Which one would you think that is the thing? I can I can actually do another interaction on this, huh? and I can actually do a, a, a word puzzle uh, using uh, Mentimeter, where you can get a bubble huh, of how many people actually answered uh, of these eight choices. You can see how many people actually answered. You can do that uh, using Mentimeter, but no, but. Uh, if anyone can actually even use your voice or if, if you want to interact with me by chatting. Which one do you think is the most uh, crucial or important? Uh, devices and connectivity. Yes, very true one. Devices and connectivity is one of the crucial thing when it comes to uh, uh, another person also answered the same thing. Devices and connectivity. If you look at all the other dimensions they can be controlled by the participants okay can be controlled by the participants huh? but device and connectivity sometimes they cannot control okay if they are unable to achieve the connectivity then you you are you are nowhere you cannot do that huh? so thinking of that or keeping that in mind this is the number one thing that we need to know is know our students, huh? who they are, where are they, what sort of devices that they use, and how their learning environment is. So I like this picture. I borrowed this from uh, uh, the guru of uh, e-learning in Malaysia, mm -hmm. uh, Karim. Huh? And uh, he has pictured it very nicely in the background where the environment and who are the students or who are the parents in this case, huh? showing the aspect of <clears throat> that can be very crucial if your students at the moment they are all at home so their home can be a very rural place so keep that in mind when we actually do our online learning <clears throat> knowing these facts uh, unimas have actually uh, or clearly uh, grouped uh, students into three different categories uh, g1 g2 and g3 eh? g1 is where nothing is a problem they have internet access good internet access and they also have their hardware. Huh? Uh, G2, weak 
or no internet access uh, and they have a, a PC laptop, but uh, the internet access is a bit slightly weak. Uh, G3, both the internet access and laptop have problem. They are not able to have this. So, so G3, yeah? now based on this category, uh, during the MCO, we have actually our faculty did, uh, I mean, all the faculties in Unimas did a survey among their students. And this was the outcome. This is the outcome. Uh, the ready for online learning. Uh, these are the number of students. Shas, I would like to, uh, if you are going to do this, uh, if medical education is actually going to do this for the coming academic session, I would suggest that we break up uh, nursing students to year one, year two, and year three, just like how we did for medicine, so that we will know actually how, <clears throat> how, uh, what is the distribution, which year are having the problem, and so on, uh, instead of grouping them all together in one uh, uh, pile. So uh, that's just my suggestion. I'm sure the faculty will actually do this uh, for the coming session. Eh? So this is the three group on G1, G2, and G3. And these are the concerned students. Okay, These are the concerned students where we have to take in consideration how are we going to actually engage these students. Okay, So that's one of the case. So it's always a matter of considering the lowest denominator okay because they actually make uh, our our planning uh, become very crucial to engage them also so why do we do this because we want to leave no one behind so we want to give the opportunity for the students to learn so this is one way of engaging everyone in the class now, now that we know that our students are ready, yeah, we are ready to continue teaching, we can offer online learning and we know our students. Oh. Now, how are we going to execute whatever that we have actually planned to do? So there are two modes, very simple. Huh? One is synchronous and asynchronous. What I'm doing now is basically is a, a synchronous uh, method, huh? whereas um, asynchronous will be in a different way. Huh? You do the video, or you do other forms of interactive activity and you place it for the students to actually engage uh, in it. <clears throat> Here's the definition. I will not read through these definitions. Now here, another task I would like to give you, if you can go through this, do you think something very glaring missing in this, uh, this list of things that are being highlighted here? The red ones are synchronous and the purple one are asynchronous. Huh? You can see some of them are overlapping, problem-based, scenario-based, challenge-based. Yes, you can do it asynchronous, and also uh, you can do uh, synchronously. Yeah? So others, what's something that is glaringly missing in rate, which is very popular at the moment, very popular way of engaging students online. It makes uh, the whole uh, class very lively fun kahoot excellent Shas. kahoot is a way of gamification 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 is missing here so gamification is also one part of uh, async uh, synchronous uh, synchronous kind of engagement now what about uh, very popular is getting very popular uh, and uh, asynchronous anyone can think of what it is these are all the different modes or different ways of how you can actually engage your students uh, using asynchronous mode. But one thing is uh, that is not there, which is very uh, uh, getting very popular at the moment. Why why this particular thing is getting popular is WhatsApp. Mm. OK, I can uh, I can take that answer. WhatsApp is one way, one way of uh, actually uh, asynchronous. You can actually do that. Huh? Uh, using WhatsApp. It, this is a very uh, nice way. Okay, I'll give you a hint is that it can actually solve some of the problems that you have when you do this kind of uh, engagement asynchronously. Problem based, scenario based, or challenge based uh, learning activities. When you do learning activities, when you do discussions, <clears throat> uh, research has identified several problems uh, related to online discussions. Uh, one of the, the crucial ones is uh, limited student participation. Okay, 
an inadequate critical uh, analysis of peers idea and uh, lack of motivation commitment time uh, sometimes failure to communicate effectively yeah? these are these are list of things that um, people have uh, researched and found out that when you do online discussion this is the problem so to overcome those problems there's one method no? it's called content curation okay it's an alternative uh, assessment um, which is uh, kind of i myself i'm not good at it now i'm testing it out uh, see whether it's uh, possible and it's uh, something for you all to look into also it's called content curation no? content curation can be in two forms you can actually give them the content or you can use a digital content you can give a question and ask them to go and find the, the content digitally and then come back and then they have to curate the word curate no? you can actually teach the students what is the meaning of curate by themselves they find out what is curation means and then they have to provide an assignment based on that it's called digital content curation Now, the second point that you'd like to highlight now when you want to consider about whether we can actually do these things is cost for going online learning. Consideration is whether it's prepaid or postpaid. The data is being used. For the time being, I just want to highlight myself. I'm actually using my data at the moment because the Wi-Fi here is quite weak that I'm not able to sustain myself on the Wi-Fi signal. Now, which mode of online learning do you prefer? Can you please go to uh, this? This will be a new uh, mentor point. And you can't use the previous uh, code. Huh? This is a new code. Huh? I'm not against uh, synchronous. Huh? Uh, you will have your reasons for why you want to do synchronous uh, or you want to do asynchronous. Huh? But um, keeping in mind, when you do uh, synchronous, the only uh, caution or only thing that I would like to highlight is uh, you must consider those students who are unable to participate uh, via synchronous. So you must provide a mean for them to uh, get whatever material that you are synchronously uh, so that they will not be lost. Okay. So the majority agrees that they will be doing synchronously. I honestly I so will be doing synchronously, but uh, I will ensure that uh, I will provide uh, materials uh, asynchronously. But sometimes when you can actually do the video directly and then uh, give the students and do it uh, asynchronously to everyone, that can also be done. No? So that the students who are um, uh, deprived uh, because of connectivity problem will not feel that they are being left out. So that that's, that's about it. No? Now, um, the next few slides, I'm just going to highlight what is the benefit of asynchronous uh, or low bandwidth online teaching mode. Uh. Students can practice self-paced learning. Students with minimal internet connectivity can access your content. Students can easily view your content on mobile devices. These are the benefits when it comes to asynchronous. So we can also highlight how are we going to create this so-called low bandwidth digital media. So the next few slides, uh, um, uh, we have actually highlight highlight um, uh, what are the sort of media that you actually have to engage uh, in order for you to um, say uh, how are you going to um, make sure that the the content that you are giving to your students uh, can be accessed by everyone. Okay, so. First of all, the video, uh, there's a very good uh, um, online um, software that is uh, you can actually send your video directly, upload to the web page, and it will compress the video to a smaller uh, size. So I've done it many times and it's very uh, good. Um, and audio files also, you can actually do a compression. Uh, you can make it into a smaller uh, size and image, uh, text files, uh, and also PDF. Huh? But text files, PDF, uh, not much of a problem, uh, and they are already small size. So even if you want to reduce the size further, you can actually do it. Okay, You can actually zip the file before you actually give it to the student 
So um, that can be done. So these are the things that you have to consider when you are actually providing materials for your students. Now, lecturer's responsibility. Now we talk about uh, somebody brought up earlier WhatsApp, uh, asynchronous mode, uh, WhatsApp. Now, um, you can use all these uh, telecommunication uh, tools uh, that you can engage with students. They are much um, rampantly used uh, and everybody is using it every day. So shouldn't be a problem of using it. But when MCO started uh, uh, and uh, we had to do our online exam and all that, uh, the, the thing that uh, question posed is that we have got 150 students who is going to punch in all their numbers into WhatsApp. No, they were asking that in the first place. But WhatsApp and even Telegram has got a function which can, uh, without you keying in their numbers, they can actually form a group. No? You can do that. So you don't have to worry about getting their numbers. They will come to you with the numbers, everything. You can actually com collect them automatically in, in that uh, particular app. Huh? So um, there is a way how to do that. So it's quite simple. Uh, again, you have to use eLeap huh? or eLeap or any other um, ways. Huh? What you have to do is that first of all, if you're using WhatsApp, I, I'll give you an example of WhatsApp because I'm very uh, familiar with WhatsApp. I do use Telegram, but uh, WhatsApp more than uh, I use Telegram. <clears throat> now, uh, when it comes to WhatsApp, you create a group, let's say for year one nursing students. Once you create that group, inside that chat group, you will go to the settings and you will actually identify a barcode. That barcode is, uh, sorry, that QR code uh, is uh, specific to that particular group. So here's an example here that I did during the MCO where you can actually uh, set it. Uh, this is for, but don't, don't scan this now, please. Huh? Uh, you will probably end up ending in my, in my course. Huh? So this is uh, during the, um, uh, one of my course that uh, I was teaching. So I set up this and then I would put it up in WhatsApp. The students have to just scan that and they are, they will be automatically uh, enrolled into the WhatsApp group. So this will be very easy for you to chat. But having said this, um, what we did, uh, I just want to share uh, for phase one, um, we did one particular uh, group chat for year one and year two. And that group chat was shared by all the other courses. So we didn't create a, a chat group for every single uh, different, different courses. Huh? We only chat did it for year one, year two, and then from year one and year two, we just continued using it for different, different courses. So you can do that, or I'm not sure how it goes for the nursing groups. Uh, if students uh, need to take particular uh, course, so therefore uh, you want to create a course specific or you want to create a year specific. I leave it up to the coordinators to decide that. No? So, but this is one way of how you can actually engage the students. Uh, uh, using a low bandwidth uh, communication. Now here, uh, other responsibilities of lecturers is that uh, when you are doing asynchronous or even uh, uh, or synchronous, you need to have feedback. Huh? Feedback. If the questions were posed to you, uh, how are you going to get back to the students? Uh, so therefore, you need to have uh, feedback and you have to have your available time. You need to give a time frame where you are available from this hour to this hour. So therefore, the students can actually engage you either through WhatsApp or through any other means or even through uh, eLeap itself. They can actually uh, engage you. Huh? And then lastly is that when you keep your students engaged in meaningful learning, they will engage in the course that you're actually providing. So therefore, these are the three things that you need to remember when it comes to your responsibility you know, feedback, availability and create an environment where they can actually uh, try with learning. Now, we discussed uh, lecturer's responsibility and students' responsibility. There are many. But one thing I just, after going through the MCO period, uh, this is the thing that I would like to share with everyone. Make sure you tell them to set a reminder on their phone. Because uh, some of the students will come back to me. I, I'll ask them, why are you not in the class now? And then they will tell, oh, I forgot. I forgot or I overslept. Okay. So uh, these are the things. When they are 
in a very comfortable environment that is their home they are in their home so uh, things get a bit uh, too relaxed and uh, they seem to have uh, there's nobody at least when they are in campus they see that their roommate is moving out of the house uh, room then they will know that uh, there's something our uh, morning have to get up and all that so here they are at home so uh, make sure you tell the students set a reminder on your phone regarding your schedule or uh, your timetable what are the things that are going to pop up uh, at eight o'clock or nine o'clock or ten o'clock so this is the only thing that i i will remind my students every now and then now uh, we have so far we have cleared these five um, the next one is uh, after we know how to execute the teaching is how good is the quality of our execution that's a question that we want to address huh? how good is the quality of our execution now um, i would like to reiterate this uh, particular phrase that this dewey guy uh, actually have thought huh? it looks like very uh, new but he's actually from the past uh, century yeah? uh, if we teach today's students as we thought yesterday's we rob them of tomorrow very meaningful eh? but bear in mind eh? this guy came up with this code somewhere in the early 1900 uh, and it's very apt for now it's still very apt for now uh, and uh, the way how we are going to teach is going to be different from now onwards and uh, very true now the quality of your execution okay um number one there will be three different uh, um factors that you can actually how good is the quality of your execution uh, that you need to consider three uh, three things that you need to uh, address here um which is the cost design uh later on i'll discuss uh, the resources and uh, finally another last part will be the the development itself huh? so cost design the first of all the cost design this is called instructional design even when you conduct a classroom based uh, teaching you need to consider instructional design uh, there are many um, models that you can actually follow one is adi and the other one is sure uh, but i will share with you later on uh, something that i've actually modified uh, and i've used this uh, um, uh, in my own uh, personal teaching uh. <clears throat> and um, basically my thoughts were accessible instructional design okay whether uh, thinking about the students and then see whether the instructional design that i'm trying to plan will it be uh, accessible to the students that i'm uh, targeting uh. will you be able to provide quality online learning i need to interact with you again uh, this is the penultimate uh, interaction that i've actually planned uh, can you please uh, log on to mentimeter and uh, have a look at this quality online learning that's the question uh, that you are asking whether we will be able to do it or not i'm happy that uh, uh, one of our participants are very confident yes that's a good thing uh, positive thinking always you'll be able to do it <clears throat> but <clears throat> surprisingly majority thinks that maybe yeah, maybe so they are not sure whether they are what they think what is what it means by quality online learning yeah. um now um not bad huh? we've got 10 responses huh? after break uh, and it's very good basically the it's a responsibility of the lecturer to actually provide a sound pedagogical principles that is appropriate uh, with teaching strategies huh? so this is what we are looking for that uh, what do you think uh, whether the the course that you are offering and the the teaching method and the way how you employ and uh, knowing uh, what your students are capable of and then catering to all this and providing it you know? so this is one way of you trying to uh, engage the students in the best way uh, possible um here is one of another model that is quite um popular among online learner uh, online or e learning uh. um <clears throat> this is called a gilly salmon's uh, five stage model this has been advocated by uh, our guru uh, local guru uh, dr karim uh, if you go to his uh, workshops he'll always tell about this uh, particular model um you can read up on this model if you're uh, not familiar with that now 
to me, I, I would, uh, you can employ different, different models, uh, whatever method, huh? but at the end of the day, uh, it's the focus is on the design of the way how you're going to present your uh, materials. Huh? It's not about the content development. While uh, having the break earlier, we had a short discussion huh, regarding this. Uh, somebody asked a question regarding this, and it was a very uh, a relevant question. Huh? It's not about you feeding back everything that you want to teach them uh, in the during the online learning, but it's more about you guiding them to actually find out whatever uh, materials that you want them to learn. So the learning design is more important than the content itself. So uh, the question was, uh, somebody asked um, videos. Uh, why is the video so big, uh, so uh, large that you cannot upload to YouTube? You're having a problem. The compression is only taking about 90%. Uh, then after that, it just dies off. The reason is that in the first place, why are you creating such a big file, big file of video? Okay. Uh, why don't you uh, chunk it into smaller uh, parts and then make it into uh, your one lecture, give it the smaller part. 15 minutes. It's a good length uh, for a video, not more than that. Uh, ideally, it can be about four to eight minutes. That will be the best. But if you run uh, longer than that, uh, then the student will not will not be very. Uh, I think that the engagement with the device and the student watching for a long time, um, that will be very difficult for them to comprehend everything. So try to make uh, the the material uh, short. Even if it's a learning uh, uh, articles or whatever you're giving uh, point form in point form, that's a different story. Eh? But if you want them to engage uh, a video for a long time, uh, that is going to you have to engage them properly during the video itself. So this is a guideline again eh, from Dr. Karim. Eh? Seventy percent of activities, uh, twenty percent of closure and 10% on reflection. Reflection basically it's about summary, yeah? whatever that you've done, uh, you compile together and then see whether you've learned anything out of this session. Okay, And the activities are the bigger chunk. Huh? So something that they do rather than actually see and, uh, and watch and, and passive way of uh, getting the knowledge. Now, what I am going to uh, share with you is that this is my own uh, one after I picked up things from here and there. Um, and uh, mind you, on this one, I did it during the the MCO, and when there was a, a teaching enhancement, a learning innovation uh, online conference uh, being organized, I think Cam was uh, circulating that uh, circular to everyone uh, to participate in this, and um, and I also uh, advocated for the faculty and then I circulated to everyone and no no one was take, uh, taking part in this. So it was kind of uh, sad, but uh, luckily uh, Prof Chu actually uh, got together and he set a team to actually um, a team effort to put in one uh, one particular uh, course for that particular telic. Uh, it's called telic, uh, Teaching Enhancement Learning Innovation uh, Carnival. And um, what I did was that my course that I conducted during the MCO, I put up that as a package and I also put that. And uh, mind you, I just got an award for this uh, this particular method of what I designed uh, using an instructional design, um, just basically taking it from here and there. So the concept of this is uh, micro learning, making it small, everything small, and then personalized e-learning means giving it back to them and they can actually uh, self-paced learning and uh, they are able to um, uh, learn 24-7 wherever that they are and all that. So it's nothing uh, synchronous. There's no synchronous at all. And then uh, retrieval practice. Retrieval practice is a, a big word for what basically is assessment, self-assessment. So this was the principles that I used. You give them a chunk in small uh, bits of uh, learning and then make it personalized and then uh, they they can retrieve the, the knowledge by doing some practices. That means the activities. Huh? So if you want to relate that to uh, the other models of uh, uh, e-learning, 
uh, those are the things. Huh? Micro learning, uh, personalized e-learning, and then uh, assessment. So this is already very well known. Huh? The process of learning through short, digestible, and well-planned units. So bite-sized learning is very uh, relevant. If you give a short video, the objective is uh, already there, and the students are able to understand uh, from that short video. That's good enough. Okay, and then this is again from uh, Dr. Karim. How not to bore your students? Okay, so um, you start with an activity, a short lecture, and then an activity again, and then lecture, and then last one assessment. <clears throat> again, the content is not important. It's the way how you structure it and how you try to fill in all whatever um, a CLO that you need to cover within that time frame. Here, I would like to share another thing. This is another thing that I did during the MCO. Um, this was uh, a different course. Um, this was actually a staff training on uh, uh, student-centered learning. Since we couldn't meet, I had to do it online. So. I clearly gave an instruction of what to do uh, based on uh, some article reading and some notes that I've already given in. So this is guide for day three. These are all things that they actually have to do. <clears throat> and then the one in the rate are resources. So you clearly tell them what are the things that they have to achieve from step one to step eight. So if they do it in sequential, they shouldn't have any problem in following uh, the instruction. Okay, so your design of the learning is more important than you actually give the uh, content. You know? I'm, I'm not giving much content here, a refresh of your memory. If you want to go back, look and if you want to do something on this, you have to go back and look at these slides to refresh your memory. Okay, and there's some short videos I gave, but the short, short videos, two or four minutes basically. Uh, there was about six videos. So those videos, they will have to go and see if they want to know something about the, the, the list of things that I've asked them to do. Then finally, <clears throat> had to do one synchronous activity, yeah? uh, quiz on Socrative. I love Socrative. I, I, I'm I very comfortable using Socrative and I would uh, advocate to everyone. Um, if you are if you're looking for a third party software that is able to do uh, assessment for students, uh, Socrative is a very good uh, website. So if you want to learn more about it, feel free to just ask me and I, I'm very happy to share with you. Okay. And um, so I did Socrative. So this was the last part, the uh, retrieval of uh, knowledge, uh, whether what they have gained from the, the assignment that I gave them. So whether they have actually learned something. If they don't learn something, then the answers I would give them back and then they will know where they made actually mistakes and so on. So um, like I told you, there are three things. Huh? First was the course design. Once you've done the course design, it's fantastic. Now the next one is learning resources. Imagine uh, you are in a remote area. You don't have access to uh, a big uh, library or whatever that uh, nearby. And um, you depend on your online and your online connectivity. You don't have access. So you need to give them resources. Okay, during online uh, learning, you need to identify the resources that they need. Or if they, if you know that the URL and YouTube, whatever, they put it up there so that they can actually do it. Um, and they can go and look for that particular uh, resource and utilize the whatever uh, thing that is inside the resource. Okay, so that's uh, clearly what, what it is. The last one is the learning activities. What are you going to do at the end? This can be in the form of a quiz, can be form of a content curation like what we discussed uh, shortly in the uh, in during our break time. So these are things that alternative assessment also can be done. So all, I am uh, kind of a pro uh, content curation at the moment because I would like to venture into that because it seems to be uh, very uh, engaging, engaging. Uh, probably would like to test it out uh, in uh, the next uh, academic session. So to see whether uh, whether it is uh, applicable or not. Huh? So uh, as I as I discussed earlier with uh, Dr. Angela, she did mention that they are doing something like that, but uh, they didn't know what they were doing is actually content curation. So well done to them. Huh? They've already figured out that, that there's a 
activity that they can actually do. Uh, therefore, it is actually called content curation. Online learning, uh, everywhere you go, you will they'll always advocate that uh, asynchronous is will be more uh, reasonable compared to synchronous. Like I said, uh, I've got nothing against synchronous. Uh, I'm also pro synchronous. Uh, but what what we can do is that we, even though we do synchronous, but make sure that uh, you don't leave anyone behind. So you must make sure that uh, people are able to access your material and whatever live activities that you do, you need to compensate or you can think something else that you can actually do it with your uh, students who have missed out uh, that that live uh, synchronous um, activity. Yeah, this is the compilation of all the learning videos that they have done. Uh, this will be in the compendium. You can actually uh, uh, get this resource from the web page in ELIP. So that's another thing. And also we need to equip, uh, equip with various different things. Um, I've done WebEx once. Uh, I've done uh, most of the time I do uh, team uh, Microsoft Teams. Zoom, I'm actually using it uh, more than actually conducting it uh, because of 40 minute restrictions. Uh, but when I meet with uh, research students, I try to use Zoom because it's a short, uh, um short kind of short meetings so zoom is good um, but like i said um, teams and uh, webex we have full access to it so uh, you can actually choose which one you want to and and use that tool huh? yep all this teaching and uh, learning can be done but at the end of the day is the assessment the assessment must follow um like i said um uh, our family it has got two programs, the nursing and uh, the me medical program. So um, we have different uh, ways of how to do that. Uh, it's, it's a paper based, uh, paper and pen based uh, examinations at the end of the day. We discussed this. Uh, I just share with you what we have discussed in uh, phase uh, one of uh, the medical program. We, we do think that if the students are physically in campus, uh, they'll be probably sitting for the exam at the end of the day. But now, since the, there's a strong possibility that the MCO might be reinitiated, so worst case scenario, the students will not be in campus. So we have to do with uh, online uh, um, assessment. So we have already had our experience of conducting online access assessment. So therefore, I think uh, we will probably follow a similar pattern. Um, like I said, uh, when I did this uh, workshop in the beginning and I did the survey, uh, uh, there was quite a number of you all requested for best practices. And also some of you all uh, were very concerned of uh, online assessment. How will we do? Um, rather online assessment, I'm, I'm keen on doing alternative assessment. So uh, my... Uh, mm, way of doing it would be to to look at content curation you can you can read up on more than maybe if we are interested then we can discuss uh, how we can actually uh, do this uh, and to model it and then see how we can uh, engage our students using this uh, so-called content curation so assessment must follow do we know how to assess our students great i have uh, 11 respondents here um, we are back to that magic number 11, 12. Um, that's very good. Uh, so most of us do know how to assess our students. That's very good huh? because we have already uh, discussed this uh, in length uh, during our phase one uh, meeting. I'm sure in your own program, the nursing programs, you all have also discussed uh, how to go about doing it. Uh, you guys are doing brilliantly. Uh, by even doing the invigilation uh, very good. So I think we shall practice, we shall maintain that uh, those practices. Huh? So we know how to assess our students. That's that's very good. Uh, people who are not uh, very sure about it, I'm sure maybe you're new or what, you, uh, your, your seniors will actually guide you on this. But if you don't have it, basically you, you can still come and see me. I'm open to discussion uh, very well. Mm, but Basic, what Unimas is uh, trying to advocate is a guideline for alternative assessment. 
there's a the module is available so you can actually use this module to see how you can actually do uh, uh, alternative assessment um i will try to get a hold of this wire cam um i did look for it in the compendium uh, i couldn't find it so maybe it is available with come i will i will look through it and then i will advise everyone regarding this huh? but um keep in mind i'm advocating for content curation okay come back to the last one huh? when when you talk about uh, assessment assessment itself we need to consider this g1 g2 and g3 huh? um those people who are very good everything is uh, doing very well and huh? the internet uh, the connectivity and the hardware is is good so you can to uh, examination online exam no problem but for those who are having problem uh, is it a good to do take home exams um, those alternative exam or take home exams then they submit so it's something for you to co consider uh, this is uh, unimas is sort of like um, giving a guideline what you can actually address uh, doing this so this is a summary of what we have actually uh, did uh, this uh, this one and a half hour time uh. are we going to continue we did yes i uh, didn't ask you guys but yes it is are we ready to offer online learning yes uh, are our students ready we know that we need to consider the g2 g3 students so if you do asynchronous uh, that's fine if you do synchronous then you have to make sure that the G2, G3 students are able to uh, get the, the knowledge sharing uh, similar to what you're doing uh, synchronously. How are we going to execute the teaching? We discuss this and then uh, we can have different modes of how to uh, tackle this question. So those are the things and how good is our quality of our execution? We, we designed our course design is very important. The content is not that important, but the cost design is more important. Uh, learning resources need to be provided and also do engage your students with uh, meaningful activities. And then we agree that assessment, uh, most of us do know, do know how to do it. The faculty has already uh, come up with an idea of how to actually assess. So we leave it to the program heads to actually uh, um, coordinate uh, with uh, all the courses to how to actually do the assessment. But meanwhile, if you as a course coordinator have the, the right to conduct um, alternative assessment, uh, do consider content curation. OK, uh, I think I, I can finish now. Uh, we still have time for some question and answer session. Feel free to ask me now. If I cannot answer, I will definitely bring it up to uh, the experts that come and they will probably give me some insights and then I can direct you all whatever that you you have in your mind. What are the uh, things that uh, you you are not you're unsure about a certain thing regarding when it comes to e-learning. So I opened up for Q&A now. Sunika, what do you mean by two forms of content curation? Do you want two? Is it two, or what exactly are you telling about content curation? Okay, <clears throat> as as what I understand, <clears throat> the the word curation, which means to take care or or to preserve something. So uh, one of the very popular popular job wise uh, uh, curation is a uh, museum when you you have you go to a museum you have a curator uh, will actually it, they will try to back and uh, try to do it so basically what they do is uh, when it comes to content curation here um, the concept started uh, not in science field uh, but it was in the arts field but then slowly it has come into other fields also now. Uh, you basically, it's the, it's the process of you find uh, and then um, trying to classify and then uh, make some organization out of something that is not organized and then sharing that best and uh, most 
relevant content on a specific issue. So when it comes to specific issue, you as an instructor, you give that issue to your students. So then they will go out and try to gather all this information and then they will share it to the class. It can be provided, it can be shared with uh, the entire class and uh, not necessarily there's an assignment back to uh, given to you to actually uh, make a, um, a judgment call at the end. Huh? But what you can do is that the content can be curated and then shared among the students. And you can probably ask the, the peer evaluation rather than you as an instructor evaluating it. Huh? Uh, needs to be filtered and uh, directed towards a specific topic that you want to actually ask. So that that's what I understand what means by content curation. Okay. You can give, okay, uh, uh, say for example, um, okay, very good. No? I think uh, I think paraclinical people will uh, know this. Huh? For example, uh, this year Nobel Prize winners huh, for chemistry is um, the two ladies huh, who actually discovered uh, uh, CRISPR Cas9. Huh? So uh, maybe what I can actually give is that uh, what is CRISPR Cas9 to my students? Okay, and they will actually go and find out and they will try to put it in a way that it makes the easiest way for them to understand what is CRISPR Cas9? What is the application? So maybe I can guide them on what are the uh, the issues that they have to address, and then they will go and get the content and then put it together and package it. They did the content curation. It's not like finding an uh, um, an essay. Huh? This is not. This is finding resource. It can be in the form of a video, uh, an article, or whatever but they have to curate it they have to make it into concise uh, summarize it and then be meaningful to somebody else who's going to actually read the thing that's what content curation is all about you can't just dump all the resources and come say okay this is the thing that i found about uh, crispr cas no so that's my understanding of content curation Okay, next question. I hope I answered your questions, Unika. You can just drop me a note if you uh, if, if that was what uh, you asked. Huh? I saw Unimas did survey among student readiness on online learning, how to handle the remaining group of students who have difficulties for online learning. How to handle, okay. Uh, Shas, is that a question that you're posing me or you're, you're asking me uh, how to handle G2 and G3? Basically, if you want to handle G2 and G3, basically you have to do asynchronous. Yeah, we we basically need to do uh, uh, with G2 and G3, we need to do uh, asynchronous uh, online teaching. Okay, we cannot go um, uh, synchronous because they cannot access, but the G3 will be a very, very challenging. Because they don't have a hardware, nothing, no laptop or no PC for everything. So the only thing that was advised uh, in one of the discussions that they, can they get access to the nearest uh, uh, government office? First of all, government office or, or nearest any place where they can actually find um, uh, internet connectivity, but it has to be government office or whatever. Then uh, the idea was we can actually provide a, a, a letter to that uh, office and saying that this is such a such a student. Uh, he or she is able. Uh, sh uh, could they be given uh, uh, access to uh, facilities in their office? I hope I answered your question, Shas. If anyone in this group are interested in doing content curation, I would like to uh, uh, be part of it. I, I'm I'm keen to uh, take up this thing uh, further, uh, so we can discuss this uh, if you all are planning to do it. Huh? I know um, uh, Angela was talking uh, about it earlier. Now that uh, Dr. Zunika is also asking uh, regarding this, so there is a there is a group that is uh, keen on doing this. So it'd be nice if we can actually. Uh, dwell into this and then see how we can actually 
um, uh, see how it can uh, progress even further. The content is actually curated and then shared with uh, someone, not in the original form. Okay, it can be a very long, lengthy one. So the students will actually summarize it, uh, get the point form, and then share it with the uh, uh, person who is uh, in the collaborative learning. Okay, that's my understanding of what content curation is. Okay, I guess I guess if we don't have any other question, I think we can stop here. But before we stop, huh? Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for participating and being an active participant in this uh, very small uh, workshop. Huh? Okay, uh, thank you very much.